Hey there, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go over topic 2.2, the science of work today. It shouldn't be a long one. Uh, there is some math involved, though, so be prepared uh, to be doing some more math. And this should be the last of the, the math section for this for this unit. So that's kind of good. We're not doing the pressure unit this or the pr pressure component this time because we already did in the mechan or the mix and flow of matter section. So here we go. So let's talk about a uh, scenario here. Okay, our textbook actually gives two great scenarios on how we know work is being done. Okay, so here's scenario one. You are playing frisbee with a bunch of buddies. Okay, there is no COVID. COVID-19 pandemic, we can be all outside, running around, having fun, and uh, you're tossing that frisbee around, okay? So going all over the place, sweating, having a good time, okay? Does that seem like work? To me, that doesn't seem like work, that seems like a lot of fun. However, again, covid is over, you have to go home and study for a test. The days of the open book tests and the very, very easy labs um, are gone, and you have to go back to doing the old fashioned work. So you go home to study for that hard science test. You sit at that table or you sit at your desk and you read through your book and you just sit there, hand on your head, reading through the book, uh, reviewing all the content. Okay, doesn't seem like work there. Or that, that, that seems like a pretty tough work, right? You're, you're, you're strain, straining, your brain's going, okay, thinking really, really, really hard, okay? Which one of these are we actually working? Typically in the classroom, Students will go and say, well, the second one is work. The first one is fun, okay? They're wrong, okay? Work is not, the, according to the scientific definition of work, if you're sitting there, standing still, not doing any uh, moving around, not exerting a force on anything. Maybe you're exerting a force on your head, but your head's not moving. It's not like you're pushing your, your head up and down. You're not working. You're just sitting there. However, when you're running around, taking that Frisbee, catching that Frisbee, giving it a toss, you are exerting a force on something. You're causing that thing to move. You're doing work. This is very important to remember. Some students get a little bit mixed up with it, um, but in order to be doing work, you have to be exerting a force on something in order to make it move. Okay, so here we go. We've got a picture of two strapping young men trying to push a damsel in distress out on a sandy beach. They're pushing, pushing, pushing. They're pushing, exerting all this force on the car. Uh, somebody's on the inside exerting a force on the gas pedal, which is in turn turning the wheel, okay? Um, but these two boys themselves, they may be pushing really, really hard, but they're not doing any work because that car is not moving. Now, if they were able to move that car a little bit, work starts happening because they're exerting a force and it causes movement. So are they working in this picture? Based on the definition of work, nope. Work is done when a force is acting on an object to make that object move. Very important definition, two very important components. Has to have the force and has to be able to move, okay? Um, if we were in the classroom, I'd ask somebody to come up to the front of the class and push on, a, on the blackboard or the whiteboard. And I have them push and push and push until their arms start getting strained and they start feeling a little bit of a, a pull in the shoulders and whatnot, okay? And then I ask them, are you tired? Are you feeling... feeling uh, feeling exhausted, do you feel a little sore? And of course the answer would be yes. And then I asked them, do you think you're working? And they'd be like, oh yeah, that was hard work. And the answer is no, because the wall didn't move. They didn't move the wall anymore. Since the car in this picture is not moving, the boys are not doing any work, okay? So very, very important, movement is needed for work. No movement, no work. Calculating work, of course, calculating work, we have math. Okay, so there's a mathematical equation. The amount of work done depends on two things. I already talked about them. Okay, the first thing is the amount of force that's exerted on an object. The other thing is the distance the object moves in the direction of the applied force. So I'm pushing here, okay? My hand is moving this direction, okay? My force is going in this direction, so I am doing work because I am moving my hand. The mathematical formula for work Please remember this, you might need a calculator, because work is simply equal to force times distance, where W is equal to F times D, okay? So back to here, W means work, F stands for force, D stands for distance. So here's an example of how much work is being done when you have to exert a force of 50 newtons to lift a chair 0.4 meters or four centimeters, okay? 
In order to do that, we have to write down a formula. Of course, read the problem a whole bunch of times. Do your givens, but I've decided to do this nice and simple so I don't have to use a whiteboard. Okay, so you write down the formula. Work is equal to force times distance. That equals 50 newtons times 0 0.4 meters. Some of you might know the answer offhand. Some of you might need a calculator. But the answer is 20 newton dot meter or 20 joules. Remember, this dot stands for multiplication. We're going newton times, multi, uh, times meters. So we call this a newton meter. So it's newton dot meter. That dot signifies that we've multiplied these two together. Or we have a letter J here, which stands for joule. And we're going to tell you where that joule came from. Okay, James Joule, he was an English scientist who was interested in the relationship between work and energy. Okay, without energy, no, uh, to provide a force on an object, there would be no work. Okay, so obviously we need to have energy in order to provide that force. If we had no energy, we wouldn't be able to push on something, so you need the energy to provide that force, and without it, there would be no work. Your energy provides the force on the bike pedals, okay, and gasoline provides the energy for cars, uh, for cars to work. To honor all of his accomplishments, because he was such an amazing scientist, James Joule had a unit of measure named after him. Okay, so the unit for work and energy is the joule. So one newton meter is equal to one joule. Okay, remember it's a newton meter. So if some of the problems say you exerted a force of five newtons over twenty centimeters, okay, you can simply go newton or force times uh, distance. So go the five newtons times 20 centimeters. You can do that, that's fine. But you have to remember the units in those cases would be newton centimeter. If you wanted to stick with the newton joule, you would have to, or sorry, newton meter, you'd have to convert that centimeter to meters, okay? So keep that up here. I'm not really gonna be testing you on it this year, but you will see it in future years. Machines and work. Machines help us do, uh, machines definitely help us do work, but using a machine does not mean less work is being done. We're still using, the, they're still doing the same amount of work. Okay. You use a machine, so you do not have to exert as much force. And this is very important. You still do the same amount of work. So if I'm lifting a box up the stairs, or I'm using a pulley to lift a box up the stairs, okay, or up that height, we're still doing the exact same amount of work, just the force that's going out is different. And the way we do this is we show, uh, we, we calculate work input and work output. Work input is the work that you are putting into it, the work output is the work that the machine's putting in, okay? So work input is the work needed to operate the machine. It's what you're doing to operate that machine. Work output is the work being done by the machine. So very similar to when we were talking about mechanical advantage, force in over force, or force out over force in, and speed ratio, distance, and uh, distance in over distance out, we're doing the exact same thing here with work input and work output. We're still using the same calculations. We're still using force. Okay, which we used in mechanical advantage, and we're still using distance, which we use in speed ratio. So machines and work example. So here's a work input example. It takes 320 newtons of force to push a wheelchair up a five meter long ramp. Calculate the work input, okay? Very simple. So we have to use 350, or 320 newtons of force to push the wheelchair. And remember one of the disadvantages of ramps is we have to go up a, a longer distance. So in this case, it's five meters. So work input is equal to force input times distance input. We're not changing the formula. We're just making sure that it's the input components we're talking about. So it's still W is equal to F times D, but for, for work input, it would make sense that it is force input times distance input. So, oops, there's a typo there. So we have 320 newtons times five meters. We end up by getting 1,600 or 1,600 Newton meters, or 1,600 joules, okay? And it should be 320, my bad. My apologies for that. So now we go and we do work output, okay? Work output example. So that exact machine has lifted the wheelchair up two meters. So the ramp may have been five meters, but once you're at the top of that ramp, you're now two meters above the ground, okay? The force of the wheelchair, so if we were to take the wheelchair and hook it up to one of our spring scales, the force pulling down on that spring scale would be 800 newtons. That's just the force of gravity pulling down. Calculate the work output. So in both cases, we can easily figure out the work output, thinking back to that very, very important lab that we did last section, okay? So work output is simply 
force output times distance output. We take 800 newtons, because that's the force output. If we were to lift it up with a spring scale, we would have 800 newtons pulling down. And now the new height is two meters. We end up by getting 600 newton meters or 600 joules. You notice they are exactly the same. As you can see, both work in and work out are the same. So now the question I pose is, do you think this is always the case? Okay. We sort of figured this out last time when we had speed ratio and mechanical advantage. We said in an ideal situation, those would always be the same. Do we think that's the case? Should they always be the same? Some of you are like, I have no idea. Some of you might be like, maybe, maybe not. Some of you might get this wrong on the test because you didn't even watch the video. So let's see, work and friction. Similar to mechanical advantage, friction affects work, okay? So of course, because friction affects force, friction is going to affect work, uh, is gonna affect work. Does the friction affect the force we put in or does it affect the force we, we get out? Does it affect the force of gravity pulling on it or does it, is it affected the force of pushing the object up the ramp? Which one of those is actually affected, okay? So obviously it's the friction works against the force input, the force that you are putting in. So if you're pushing a load up a ramp, the friction is, get, is affecting um, the force that you have to exert pushing the load up the ramp. And obviously you would have to go over greater distance, but that wouldn't really affect the friction. Uh, that wouldn't be affected by friction. If we needed to go five meters, whether we were pushing really, really hard or whether it was really, really smooth surface, it's still gonna be five meters. So it's only the force that gets affected. Friction does not affect the, for the work output because that's the final location where there is no longer any friction. You push that load up the ramp, it's now two meters above the ground. And again, if we were to take a spring scale and lift that load up, or lift the, the load up or the wheelchair up with the spring scale, the force of gravity pulling down would not aff be affected by friction because it's done. There is no friction there. We're, not, um, we're only uh, measuring the force that's pulling down on it. So, of course, there is a formula for efficiency on friction, just like there was a formula for efficiency on the previous section. And that formula is work output divided by work input times 100, 100. And again, this is measured in percent, okay? We went through this section fairly quickly. That's it. We're done uh, section 2.2, okay? Um, Hopefully you'll be seeing questions like these again. Um, I know there's some efficiency questions in grade nine. I know in higher level physics, even though these, these, even though these calculations seem very straightforward, there's a lot of manipulating of formulas and whatnot that have to be done. I personally found that stuff kind of fun. I was kind of weird that way where I enjoyed solving math problems and whatnot when I was in university and, and high school. Some of you might enjoy it. Others might think, no, stay away from me. I want nothing to do with uh, with any of this stuff. But at the end of the day, it's just that basic formula, okay? Uh, that's it for this section. Um, I'm, we're done topic two. So now after this video, you can go write the quiz for topic two. Hopefully you don't write it until after you watch this video because uh, this video will help you at the quiz. And if you don't watch the video, you may get questions wrong. So I highly recommend and it's been like this for the whole entire uh, time we've been at home. Make sure you watch these lessons before you do these quizzes. All right, have a great day, guys.